Okay, Nancy, why don't you go ahead and continue with your intro. So um, I live in Santa Cruz, uh, California, and I do now the last, I lived for several years in China and then a couple of years in Ohio recently to give myself a little bit of exposure to other parts of the world. And I've been involved often in this conversation, I guess, ever since Linda got them going. Um, we've had some really profound discussions of similarities and differences and the whole question of why would people come together to talk with each other across their differences. I've been reading what Stephen has written um, and I very much appreciated the sharing that has occurred here and I've turned around, I'm in a number of other spaces online and in my local community of people trying to explore um, finding common ground and figuring out what that would even mean. And I'm also gotten, I'm also really interested in trying to create deep systems change. I want to have our dialogues not only be discovery of our shared humanness and our care for each other, but our need for and capacity to work together to find deeper changes to our systems that will actually start solving our real problems rather than the distractions of much of the political process that I think is a classic case of divide and conquer. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of where I'm coming from and I'm, I have learned so much in each of the calls we've been on, so I'm looking forward to that again today. Thank you, Nancy. Howard, would you be willing to go next? Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I, my background is just basically uh, I was really interested in David Bohm's work and I went to a couple, a few of his seminars way back in the late 80s and early 90s. And I have continued to do dialogues uh, like uh, local face-to-face -face groups and anytime I can do it online. And the reason why I'm here is because I like to support this, the kind of work that you're doing here and any anything related to uh you know like what nancy just said you know getting at a deeper level and uh you know then to solve these uh conflicts that we seem to have in relationship uh i live uh like uh linda mentioned in simi valley that's uh, just in ventura county just uh, north of uh, los angeles uh so that's that's roughly it thank you thank you howard let's see mm -hmm. Ken, would you be willing to go next? Hello, everybody. My name is Ken Homer. I live in Centerfell, California. I'm on the NCDD list. I've been associated with NCDD since 2002, actually. I've been to several of their conferences and um, very uh, happy to see all the work that they've been doing and the way they've grown. Linda, I've been um, looking at your emails on that list for many years. Uh, uh, friend and colleague Glenna Gerard also spent 10 years as one of the developers of the World Cafe dialogue process and my work these days focuses mainly in the business arena of how to get people to collaborate and for some reason when you put up that you're doing collaborative conversations people come to you and say how do we heal these big divides um, even though that's not the, the focus of my work it often comes up so um, I'm always looking for new ways techniques uh, theories models anything that's useful to help bring people together who are having a divide. Uh, personally, I find the best way to do that is to build a relationship first and not attempt to uh, tackle anything it's, that's divisive, but rather get to see each other as human beings before we start to work on what divides us. Um, and uh, I have to say that um, this last 24 hours since the firing of Comey is, uh, I'm just watching things spiral out on Twitter and through the mainstream media <laughs> Wow, this is uh, this is a really interesting time, and what can we as ordinary citizens do to um, try and bring a little sanity here? Because uh, you know, without being declaring any sort of partisan uh, stance, I just have to say this kind of chaos is not what I expect from a, my country, from you know, the the land that I grew up in and the narrative that I inherited. Uh, there's something else going on here that's really, really foreign to me. I'm pretty confused and looking for um, 
uh, some ways to make sense out of that. Um, so I'm open to any ideas, left, right, center, up, hmm. down, up inside out, out, whatever. Just it's going nuts out there. You're in the right place. I think we're all feeling that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Steve, do you want to introduce yourself? Steve Messenger. Uh, I think you're on mute, Steve. We can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Try unplugging your microphone and plugging it back in. That often works for me. You're unmuted from our end, so it may be your end. Hear me now? Uh, very light, but we can hear you. You're getting... You're getting there. Well, I don't know how to make it. That's good. Just maybe uh, increase the volume a little bit, if there's any way. President Trump has fired FBI Director James Comer over his handling of the investigation. Just channel your true anger, Stephen, and speak up. We can hear you then. Yeah. <laughs> So I have a volume here for the microphone, but it's just increasing what I hear. It's not, I don't know if it's changing what you hear. I can hear you. Oh. I had to increase my volume. Can you all hear him? Yeah, it's super yeah. weak, but yeah. Yeah. yeah go ahead. We're, you're good. You're on. All right. My background is engineering. Um, I'm not in the profession like you folks are of dialoguing or communicating or anything. Basically, if anything, my education is um, critical thinking, for lack of a better word. My claim to fame is I'm one of the folks mentioned in the acknowledgments of the righteous mind. Second claim to fame is I know Scott Wagner. So uh, that's, that's what those two things are what bring me here. Great. And I just wanted to mention to some of you that you, uh, I may not have mentioned this before because you came on late. Uh, Steve has written uh, an amazing piece. I'm only about halfway through it, Steve, but I really am enjoying it. And I know Nancy's been reading some of it. So I'm sure um, both Nancy and I may have some questions for you on it. Uh, it's very well researched okay. that way. And I'm sure Steve would be willing to share it, but I'll leave that to uh, him later. Okay, let's hear from Scott Wagner. Scott. Hey, y'all. Um, yeah, I wrote a book I guess most of you know about called The Liberal's Guide to Conservatives. Uh, you know, in the epilogue of that, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I, I, I do a lot of activism uh, that is contentious. Um, and I, I don't get to utilize the principles the same way that I'd like to that I covered in the book. Um, so, but in the in the beginning of the epilogue, I said something like, you know, these, these people will always frustrate me and I will never really understand them. And, and I really believe that's kind of true. I think Steve and I can, can testify, you know, Steve, Steve sort of rotates rather violently between, wow, you really get us and geez, you just don't know a damn thing, you know? And, and I think that's right. Um, I think it's, it's just a, an, uh, an, a way to say what a far country these people are and, and um, you know, why Ken's, Ken, what Ken said is so simple and, and so important that, you know, why would you talk about politics if you really want to get along with somebody that doesn't agree with you politically, um, you know, avoid politics for, I don't know, a year, two years, five years, you know, that's fine with me. That's what I do, um, you know, that because the relationship is so important. And why is the relationship important? Well, it's important because when you say things, now they mean something else because that's the way life works. When, when, you, when you say something but the person knows you, um, you get lots of benefit of doubt and that kind of thing. So I feel I can when you said that. It, you know, I think the book is like 300 pages long and I feel like I kind of said over and over again for 80 pages, you know, uh, what you said, get to know these people, come on, you know, um, 
figure all that other stuff out later because it just kind of comes out in the wash a lot of it. And what doesn't, yeah, then you can have interesting and clear communication without a whole lot of strange, random acrimony coming in. So, yeah. Anyway, that's me right now. Thanks, Scott. We'll come back to that, I'm sure. That's a great theme. Dennis, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Dennis, are you there? He's on mute. No, can no, he's not. Me? There you are. Now can you he's... hear me? Okay. I'm, uh, I have a satellite internet connection. I'm in a rural area, and right now there's an atmospheric disturbance, so I'm, I'm trying to minimize my uh, uplink bandwidth by uh, switching off by either muting or cutting my video. Uh, I am a D&D a &D practitioner of a sort, came to it later in life. I uh, worked primarily in dispute resolution initially, uh, but I, uh, uh, I am not a, a neutral in my personal life. I'm quite active uh, politically, so I've had to learn to be an honest broker over time in a number of, of settings. Uh, I think I've done a, a pretty good job of that. It, uh, at least up to now, uh, at least up to the feeling like I'm now part of the resistance. <laughs> so that's that's been a shift for me. Um, but I still appreciate other views and, and uh, try to understand them. And I think I can still effectively operate in those uh, in those realms. At the same time, I'm giving a lot more additional thought to uh, how to accommodate activism and those roles at the same time. And uh, uh, I, you probably know this name. I live about 50 miles from him. Occasionally we get together for lunch, and that's uh, Parker Palmer. And he often reminds me of, of the tensions in the community of, say, abolitionists and the people uh, who uh, uh, were involved in the run-up to the Civil War. What a challenge it was for some of them, especially pacifists among that movement. And uh, he said there's a lot of tensions there, and one of the chief tasks of, of citizenship is resolving those tensions. So that's something I continue to do, and that's why I tune into this lovely event. Wow. Thank you, Linda, for bringing us together. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to hear what's, what people are doing out there. Uh, John, uh, Jerry, I'm sorry, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Jerry Talley. I am an organizational development consultant. I've been practicing here in Silicon Valley, California for about 40 years. Uh, For-profit, public sector, not-for-profit, everything but retail. Somehow Walmart thinks they can do without me. But, um, I recently attended for the first time a local political meeting. It was organized under the Resist Movement. And I sat and watched 80 people in Sunnyvale, which was a pretty big turnout given that we only invited about four square blocks. Um, basically recreate the dysfunctionality that I see in Congress. <laughs> everybody stood up and got a chance to bang the drum that they had with them. And at the end of the meeting, I don't think anybody understood anybody any better. Uh. And more importantly, the group of 80 was still a group of 80 separate individuals. They never came together and identified some common ground or shared interest. So I went up to the leader and I said, this was a great meeting, thank you very much, but it was really badly facilitated. Um, if you'd like some help, I'd be glad to pitch in. So now I'm gonna be leading another meeting soon. So I uh, signed up for this group uh, in somewhat desperation and with some hope. Uh, I have a plan for how to handle the meeting, but uh, my guess is that um, I should be in a learning mode. Sounds like most of you have done things like this before. So. I'm eager to hear what, what comes out of the conversation. All right, Jerry, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for reaching out. I think this is new for really all of us, this level of political turmoil right now. So uh, I'm really hearing that we all are here to hear what everyone else is doing and maybe to just talk about what is working. And I also really want to take advantage of our, our guests, Stephen and uh, um, Scott, uh, Scott, because they have really studied this a lot. Um, I guess I just, I, the one question that's on my mind in particular, maybe it's just a place to start, and I'm totally um, eager for any of you to jump in with other questions as we get going with our dialogue. And, you know, let's remember to go one person at a time. I think we will. I'm actually finding in a virtual environment, um, we do all speak one at a time, so it's really nice. And when we're not talking, 
other than myself, if you'd be so kind as to put yourself on mute, that way we'll know who's talking because they won't be on mute uh, other than myself so that I can kind of direct traffic. So the one question I'd like to just start with, and it seems to be the same question we've had almost every single time, but now that we have Scott and especially Steve with us, how do we get uh, conservatives to even come into meetings where we talk uh, about what our differences are? I uh, just got done with a community forum. I called it the Two Back Community Forum in my little village um, community. We had about 15, uh, sometimes we had as many as 20 people. But everybody was fairly much uh, left of middle. We had one man that was more conservative. And of course, dialogue will always drill down to where the conflicts are. And so we noticed that we started to very quickly bump up against some of those edges, even though he wasn't, he wouldn't have labeled himself a conservative, but he did have a more conservative perspective. But we really tried to bring more conservative people into our, into our forum, and we just couldn't seem to attract them. So uh, that's a question I have. Why would, why would conservatives want to join a dialogue about political differences? How do we get them there? We got you, Steve. <laughs> Rosa, did you want to say something? You're on mute, Rosa. Thanks. I actually had a question for Jerry, and I, I, I want to say that I really think that the question you're asking is totally important. And at the same time, I, I think that um, having conversations within divides can be as useful as having conversations across the, the divides. And it sounds like Jerry was talking about organizing a group of people who might, we might consider as all progressive or like that. And yet, um, how do we deal with the differences within within divides so that we can be better organized? That may not at all be the topic of what we're talking about right now, and I'm totally happy to leave it, but I just I wanted to clarify because it, it, it's a personal interest of mine, and it sounds like that's what Jerry was talking about. So I'd be open to connecting offline or whatever as well. Yeah. Rosa, let me give you a quick answer. Uh, the group was generally progressive. I would say there were four or five people that were fairly conservative, and I think most of them were afraid to self-identify. Um, we've decided that uh, each of us, we know people uh, in our friendship group or workers who are you know, on more on the conservative end. So for the next meeting, we've asked people to bring one. Um, oh, okay. And, and we made a promise. Uh, the promise was that we were going to try and have a very different kind of conversation. And we suggested some of the ground rules that we were going to adopt. And the strategy was we really need to talk to each other and understand each other. And, and that's what we were going to offer. Okay, cool. Thanks for the clarification. It's just because I thought, I thought you had said it was an indivisible group. And so I thought that it was maybe um, organizing within the divide. So thank you. Well, no, we had several people who were Trump supporters for Bernie. Ah, <laughs> Republicans for Bernie, rather. Um, so we, we have some. Uh, but yes, it's mo this area is mostly fairly progressive. Right. And I guess I just want to say that even when we're working with progressive people, a lot of, of differences come up, such as, for instance, Bernie and, and Hillary and like that. So I'm... Actually, one of the things that came out of the group, I've out, I now attended two, and it came out in both groups, uh, after we kind of went through the standard run of, of Trump bashing, um, people started to say, you know, the real problem is that our democratic institutions are broken, and we need to start rebuilding them at the grassroots and try and model for people in Congress how democracy actually works. So that's kind of what we've been offering to people, is a chance to get back to what democracy once was which was a more open and creative exploration of diversity of opinion. It wasn't dividing the house and then seeing who's got the biggest crowd. Yeah, I can certainly say that that's what we did in our community forum. We, we, we really dug down deeply into the institutional issues and structural issues of our current democracy. And our one conservative man um, felt that we were going too far out, that he wanted more of a step-by-step -step sort of change to, um, things that were going on. 
Um, so I'm noticing we have two other people. I just want to make sure you um, get your names out into the space first. Lisa, you've just joined us. And um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? What draws you to the conversation? Well, I'm really, really fascinated with um, dialogue about very polarized subjects. In fact, we tried to do a little bit at the conferences we do. Um, and I always need to increase my skills. Um, I'm finding it extremely challenging to talk to anyone in this atmosphere. You talk to people on the liberal side, and if you don't say what's politically correct, they come down on you. You talk to people on the conservative side, and if they just come down on you anyway. So how do you get that atmosphere that, of acceptance, even with the liberal people? I was in a dialogue about immigration a few weeks ago, and I tried to raise the, the, um, you know, the devil's advocate point of view, and I got shot down in two seconds. So how do you create that openness to different ideas, even if they're going to cause a lot of cognitive dissonance and disagreement? That, that's the big challenge. Right, it always is, yeah. I can, uh, I, I can try to address that. You got another person, right? We want to get- yeah, let's, let's get all these people introduced. Uh, someone came on with a 775 number. Can you tell us your name and where you're from and what draws you to the group? I think, uh, I think you may be on- That was me. Oh, that was you. Okay, so you're on two places. All right, I think we're all here. Go ahead, uh, Scott. Well, I just, um, you know, this is, this is again uh, uh, Howard's point, uh, not to be a broken record, but a lot of, a lot of the real challenge, and, and I, I hope that dialogue people can recognize this, is that you, you have to hear different things than what you're normally hearing when you're having conversations about politics. And in order to do that, you have to be able to, to take a whole lot of biases off the table that you normally are coming to that conversation with. Um, we all, all of us that are ide ideological, we have these shorthand ways of speaking um, to our own crowds, especially. And, you know, some, something that that we all have to remember is that language is this, this you don't get to say freedom and think that people know what you mean. Uh, the, the reason why is because when you say the word freedom, there is a, a collection of probably hundreds of different things in your subconscious mind that make up you know, the building blocks of your notion of freedom. So then somebody else says almost anything um, that isn't in your, your own little group that has, you know, built a very, very similar set of images around the notion of freedom. And they say one little thing that, that, has, that, that is antithetical against just one piece of those hundreds of things that make up your freedom, and off you go. No, no, you have to address that right now because that's a that that has nothing to do with freedom and here's why and 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 off you go in this miasma of stupidity where people are just kind of talking and talking and talking <laughs> and not meaning anything literally we don't mean anything to these other people when we speak to them and so you know that that to me lisa is is, a, is an important answer to what you're saying is it dialogue you know, and, and this isn't dialogue professionals per se, this is human beings. We, we, we often think that we can just, because we know a language, that we get to converse with people. And it's just simply not true. In order to converse with people, we have to pull aside this cobweb of, of literally dozens and dozens of popular biases that, that are in, um, that are in a, you know, that, that place us in, in this prison, this self-enclosed prison. And, um, and I'm, you know, I'm only aware of the biases now because I've been dealing with it for six or seven years, but gosh, you know, I don't get out of it. I have the same problem. I don't get to talk to people about politics, just walking up to them and, and do that. You know, I don't. Um, so this is the, the dialogue professional idea that we're just going to get together in a room and these people with no understanding of what I just talked about and absolutely no appreciation for anything like that are suddenly going to be able to talk policy. I mean, my God, you know? It, it, to me, it's just a dumb idea. It's always going to be dumb. It's never going to work, yeah. you know? 
So for me, what has to happen at the beginning, and this is, this is why I, I've done the work I've done, you know, you got to talk a little bit about uh, these very powerful personality differences. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's five that we know of. I think there's six or seven, but whatever. Um, yeah, you got to talk about biases. You have to get people inspired to understand, wow, I am warping my own reality the same way that these other people are. And I can see that they're warping theirs, but I have no idea how I'm warping mine because I'm the cameraman, you know, I'm, I'm moving around and looking and the camera doesn't get to look at me. I'm, I'm all screwed up. And that's so hard. It's really, really difficult. So, so in a way that part of this whole business is, is kind of psychotherapy, you know, in that sense. Mm -hmm. And then there's other pieces of the, uh, of, of the overall approach too, but that, that basic idea that, you know, you don't know what you're doing. You have no idea how hard this is because you're not respecting the ground rules and you haven't been inspired to get humble about this process in an adequate way. Yeah, that's great. Ken, I see you've got your hand up. Thank you, Scott. It's really refreshing to hear you speak. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, I'm a coach and a facilitator. And in my coaching training almost 20 years ago, one of the things that I learned is I can't solve my clients' problems for them. What I can do is look to see what types of um, challenges they're having that are getting in the way of their own handling of their problems, and then identify what competencies can I build that will help them to handle their issues themselves, because I can't be there to work with them all the time. So when I listen to a conversation like this, and I hear people say, how do we get those people over there to listen to us? I think there's a competence that is missing here, which is first, how do we listen to them? How do we hear what's really important to them? And I'm thinking back, geez, going back close to 30 years now, there, there was the, well, the Public Conversations Project, which is now something like Inspiring Partners. They did this work with uh, pro-life and pro-choice people, and it they brought together women from both sides and they spent an entire year simply unpacking the trigger words that when you say this, I immediately lose my ability to see you as a human being and all of a sudden they we're into polarization. So there's a competence I think that needs to be built on the part of people who want to bring folks together of finding some useful processes that allow us to hear that when you say X, I hear Y, and we have the, already we're, we have swords crossed. And I think it can be done effectively. I think it can be done in a, a way that actually is inspiring, that helps people to, with humor, that helps them to see you know, the, that we all do this. None of us are, are immune from these conscious and unconscious biases that we all have these shortcuts in our brains. And what has happened with the Public Conversations Project in that particular group is that after a year of working like that, the women actually began to talk to each other and, and hear and value the other side's perspectives. So we need to build a competence with people of listening and saying, you know, I really disagree with you. And when you use certain words, they make me see red and I can't hear you anymore. But I recognize that's my thing to get over. And I really want to get past that. So I'm going to practice my listening. But I, we need to together unpack one of the things that, that the minute we hear them turn us off and turn us away from each other. I work with conversation, not dialogue. Dialogue is a much deeper thing for me. Conversation comes from the Latin word to turn together. So what are we turning together to face and how are we turning together to deal with it? And um, what are the ways that we can, we can not come head on at what divides us, but, but come in the side door of, of how can we be more generous listeners to each other? How can we understand that your perspective is different than mine and I don't have to adopt it as my own, nor do I have to feel threatened by it that you're trying to, to convince me and talk me out of my position, but that we can coexist in a larger setting that says, even though we share these different perspectives, they can be generative of new ideas instead of clinging to old ideologies that have to, to assert dominance over one another. That to me is the, the, the lens through which I look at this of what's the competence to, to turn people towards that and away from I've got to be right at all costs. Because if I have to be right at all costs, then everybody else has to be wrong. And that's a recipe for, for disaster. And I'll be quiet now. Steve. 
I found a uh, control for the microphone. Do you hear me better now? All right, so I wanna try to continue the thread that Scott and Ken have continued here. Uh, first with a little story and then with a couple of examples. The story is after I graduated from college with my mechanical engineering degree, I thought I would be adventurous. I took a job um, working on oil rigs in Wyoming. And um, so one of the days on, on the rig, one of the guys there, just a young kid, the roughneck, the guys who are, who are actually working the pipe into and out of the hole that they're drilling, he shows up looking like he got beat up. And, I, and just without even thinking, I just look at him and I go, what happened to you? And this was like a 22 year old, but he said something that I thought displayed a maturity beyond his years. At least now I think looking back at it, back then I just thought it was a good line. But he said, I was talking when I should have been listening. And I think what, I think that's sort of a continuation of the thread that I'm hearing both from Scott and Ken. I think we have this urge to put our own ideas out there rather than try to hear the idea from the other person. Another one of the classes I, I had in college was, uh, this is where I call my critical thinking class. It was actually in the, in the, in the business school but one of the very first things that the professor told and told us in one of the very first lectures was when someone else is talking try to put yourself in their head and don't listen for the purpose of coming up with arguments to refute them but instead listen for the purpose of trying to if you had to repeat what they were saying in a way they would agree with and that just kind of stuck with me so, so let's take that idea, and now I want to transfer to what I see us talking about here. Um, everyone, I just pulled a couple books off my shelf. Everyone familiar with this book? Mm -hmm. Okay. And here's another one along the same lines. Quiet by Susan Cain. It is called The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop talking. So my point here is that <laughs> I think um, in both of these cases, in the cases of men are from Mars and women are from Venus, we're talking about two different psychological profiles, two different ways of existing in the world. Uh, and the same is true, I believe, with introverts and extroverts. These are, these are different types of, of people. I happen to be an introvert. For me, the idea of a, of a good evening, of a nice night, is maybe dinner with one or two friends and a glass of wine and some nice conversation. This is what recharges my batteries. Extroverts are not like that. Extroverts, what recharges their batteries is going to a party and having tons of people around and noise and chaos and engagement and 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 all this kind of, these are very different personality types if you will uh, psychological profiles is what i call them so what i think is often missing from these conversations about left and right in my my opinion my belief is that the same thing is happening there you know, liberals are from Mars and conservatives are from Venus. And we, as Scott says, we really, really do use different languages. We speak entirely different languages. The trick is though, that both of these languages use the same words. So like when Scott says liberty or fairness or equality or for something, when you're on Mars, it means an entirely different thing to someone who's on Venus and when and so we end up talking past each other and when we say I think in order to have liberty we should do X someone on the other side says what are you nuts that's the opposite of liberty so I think we need to take the lessons from things like this and try to 
look at this conversation between left and right in in the same way and and try to another book i read this one was written by a woman it's um but and i've mentioned it before here is the proper care and feeding of husbands by dr yeah. laura schlesinger right so what she did though was she tried to get into the head of the men and and try to understand what it is that really makes them tick. What is it that really motivates them? And translate that so that the woman can see and understand what this thing is that she's connected with and, and, and how to deal with it. And I think what I'm shooting for here is, is more of that kind of, of, of um, realization. First of all, the first thing we have to do is realize and understand that liberals are from Mars and conservatives are from Venus, okay? We don't even know that at this point in our conversation. So when we have these town hall meetings, we think we're all from the same planet and we're not, so that when someone else from a different planet says something we don't understand, our only possible way to conceive of it is to think they must be crazy. So I think this is, this is a first step that we need to get past. Nancy, yeah, so you had your hand up a while back. Uh, do you still want to say something? And I'll get to you in just a minute, uh, Lisa. You're on mute, Nancy. Um, I have a quick question. How do you interpret that? How, how do you... How do you interpret that when liberals and cells are having a discussion and they even have different viewpoints and they're saying, oh, well, that's not politically correct. I mean, conservatives are the same thing. How do you have that conversation when liberals and conservatives themselves are having trouble trying to get past their own different biases? Well, I think this goes back to what Rosa was bringing up. I mean, even in my little community forum group, we were mainly liberals. It took us a long, long time. We met for 12 weeks and we did get to some pretty deep places, but you know, in general, um, it takes forever, even for a couple in a relationship to truly get to know the other. And, and as much as we ever try, we never completely understand the other. So it's, you know, it's all relative. Um, but I, I think the thing that we're saying is it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of uh, capacity for listening rather than to constantly be putting our views out for sure. Um, and there are tricks you could use, like Scott mentions in his book, of um, using the, the improv comedy technique of whenever someone else something, says something, you say yes, and you never say no. Never respond with no or but. You say yes, and. Build on the conversation and keep increasing the, the knowledge, if you will, rather than trying to rebut. Yes, I would say you're right. Uh, Nancy, did you have something you wanted to say? Just a couple of things. Uh, going back to your original question, how do, quote, we get them to come over here and talk to us about what we want to talk about? <laughs> Which isn't how you said it, but it is often in effect with the best of intentions, how people initially trying to reach out, think of it and phrase it and talk about, well, they won't come over or we had this conversation, but the only people that showed up were the people who thought like us, or at least the only people who spoke up were the ones who dared say something that sounded like what the rest of us were saying. And a couple thoughts were coming up for me. One is, Whoever it is that you want to have come together, the people who, leaders from those different groups need to come together and jointly arrive at a basis for bringing this diverse group of people together in the first place. The invitation needs to be framed from the different perspectives. The purposes have to be really, really clear, no bait and switch real clarity no you're not being invited in here so we can help you understand that you're wrong but rather you know we genuinely want to learn or whatever the purpose is and then the process again needs to be agreed upon by people from the different perspectives 
at the outset. And some of the rules we've been saying across the board, any process that helps us connect more as human beings, focusing more on stories and experiences, discerning both our remarkable similarities and our unexpected and expected differences and unexpected similarities, and going back to where does the argument start? It starts inside me. I'm filled with contradictory ideas if I'm honest about it. I can have arguments inside my own head. And one of the things that many of us do often in groups is I project my diff the things I'm unsure about, I put off on somebody else and argue with them. I had some friends years ago who learned a technique as a married couple that has stayed with me. The technique they'd learned, um, they were trying to decide whether or not to move to Washington, D.C. Um, a very liberal, the man was very liberal. He'd been working for the pres Governor Brown 40, 20 years, however long ago it was his first round. And he'd lost his job when the election changed. And a conservative congressman invited him to come to Washington and be his lead staff because he was sufficiently open. So they're debating whether or not to go to Washington, leave their family, et cetera. And so first he's really pushing about what a great career opportunity is. There's nothing left for him in California anyhow. And she's talking about family and friends and community and home. And then all of a sudden, at a certain moment, they simply switched. Hmm. She started arguing for why they should go to Washington. And he started arguing for why they should stay in California. It was a technique, but it was really powerful. So those, um, I think the last point I want to make, I mentioned it earlier, but I want to come back to it, is I feel like an awful lot of the focus on the invitation to create an identity for ourselves and buy into an identity as to who we are coming down to red or blue, who I voted for in a secret ballot, by the way, <laughs> in the last election. And then that defines who I am, just is astounding, just astounding. And I find myself wanting to, it's not that we should or shouldn't talk about politics. We should connect as people. And then we should start trying to uncover with each other what are the needs that are not being met? And what are the new solutions and exciting ideas out there that attract us? And how can we put our complementary perspectives and skills, differing and complementary and much needed to get the whole perspective together to help solving, stop, stop, solve our real problems. If we are solving our real problems, then the power of the false promises and the political manipulation goes away. Thanks, Nancy. I'll get off my soapbox. Uh, Jason, I don't think you have introduced yourself. I think you just jumped on. Can you tell us um, a little bit about yourself and what draws you to the conversation? You're on mute. See if I can take him off. There he is. Jason, are you there? Hello. Well, I guess we'll come back to him. And I noticed, Dennis, you have your hand up. Why don't you go ahead? And you are on mute. I'm here. Can you uh, hear me now? Jason says his mic's not working in the chat box there. So he's trying, but he can't get it. Oh. Thanks for looking at that. I wasn't aware. Go ahead. This Dale. is Dennis. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I, I'm going back to the initial question was how to get folk, other folks involved in the discussion. But I, I guess I, I, I'd like to submit an idea that maybe the, the, the who uh, is overly restrictive. Uh, you know, I, I think it's usually framed as how do we get conservatives involved in discussions. But I think it's a broader question how we get uh, a diversity of opinion. And uh, I don't think that's that conservatives are the only excluded 
uh, people and discussions. You know, certainly if you have a uh, a talk with people of color, they're going to tell you something quite different. Uh, and uh, for that matter, you know, Greens, socialists, uh, libertarians. Uh, that uh, so I, I don't. Uh, we put a, a lot of stock in reaching out to conservatives, uh, but I think there, there's more to it than that. Now, when we get into the techniques, I, I, I've heard some good things here, and uh, uh, some of them I'm interested in looking at further and, and trying out myself. But I have kind of three standbys, and the, one, the first one sort of starts with uh, the thing that Ken launched and others expanded on, and that's uh, plain old uh, trust building. You have to, you know, to uh, establish relationships, uh, maybe even some exercises, some things that are uh, uh, a little simpler. Uh, one, I've been, I'm often involved with, with uh, environmental groups. And one of the things I did with Trout Unlimited was to get a range of uh, stakeholders, uh, often people who were fighting each other about other things, I got them out on a stream improvement day, kind of a work party. I did the same uh, with a trail association about uh, trail maintenance. And uh, if you can find those things, it, it is relationship builder. Well, that's the first facet. One, the second thing I'm going to mention goes to uh, uh, Nancy's reply on some of these questions about, uh, uh, you know, having them talk about what you want to talk about. I guess I stand on on, a, on its head and ask those others that I'm trying to get involved what they want to talk about and how to understand their framings in advance. And it, with cons conservatives, we're going to use that kind of description or handle. Uh, I've had no trouble attracting uh, conservatives to discussions of, uh, on, say, Second Amendment rights, uh, on a variety of land use issues, conservation issues. But I got to tell you, I've not had luck uh, in attracting conservatives to things that, uh, how can I put it best, that we're, we're often emotion-driven or feel, as they saw it, feelings. And uh, so when I was cooperating with John Spady of the National Di uh, Dialogue Network on his conversations on inequality, it was real hard to get conservatives involved in those discussions. Not I don't think they're oblivious to inequality, but I don't think they saw that as the biggest thing uh, going on at the time. On well, a third item about things in my toolkit, uh, when I'm trying to deal with people of adverse views, is to start conceptual. I find if you start on the problem itself, the bone of contention, it's often real hard uh, to get a, on a good footing. On the other hand, if you develop some hypotheticals or some generalities, that are a bit more detached from the conflict zone, uh, you can get them exploring their values and their concerns and uh, finding some common ground. So just in short, that's my thumbnail. I won't go on more because a lot of people covered the things I might have said otherwise. So thanks for that. Sure. I'm done. Rosa? Hi, Mom. I'm surprised to not have heard anybody bring up the standard NCDD recommendation, which has been to, uh, to pair up, to create a convening group that reflects the diversities that you want to reach out to. Um, it seems to me that that is uh, a really key part of the whole thing. I, I really appreciated uh, what you said, Dennis, in terms of um, the importance of, of choosing issues that the people that we want to attract want to talk about instead of trying to get people to come to our issues. Um, I also really appreciate the value of trust building. Um, and I agree that this is a process that often takes time. At the same time, my experience is that it doesn't have to take as much time as we usually think we do, depending on the kind of structure that we set up for the process. Um, 
I am very interested in learning other approaches, but I'm not here because I don't have anything that works. I um, actually came back from teaching a workshop in Maine recently and was very moved because um, this is all people who are wanting to learn how to work with very uh, challenging issues. But what we do so that they get some good practice is to choose large scale social issues on which there is a lot of controversy and then ensure that the small groups are ones where there is a really strong diversity of perspectives. So one of the practice groups was working on the issue of guns. And there was a very strong gun rights advocate and there were some very uh, strong gun control advocates. And they, they had a pretty transformative experience in that small group over their day long of, of practice. It was very, very moving to everybody in the group and also to the rest of us in the workshop. So based on the work that I do, I, I think that I think that we can do a lot to create as as facilitators, as conveners, we can do a lot to create environments where each person feels heard. Mm -hmm. and where people become curious and less defensive and um, people were talking about language before and I think that's so important one of the key questions um, in the work that I do is just really gently not in a confrontational way but just really gently asking a person you know what do you mean when you say x um, because we um, we really do need to unpack all of that and I guess I know a lot of people have some issues about the work that we do because we're not having people talk directly to each other but speak to the facilitator, etc. I really consider it training wheels for dialogue because that's only the format for the initial part of it. And once a lot of the differences have gotten on the table, then people are able to speak directly to each other in a much more relaxed way. So just to put that out there. Um, yes, Lisa. Um, I have to go in a few minutes. We have a meeting, but I want to thank everyone. And Ken, I might want to get in touch with you later to flesh out some of your ideas. I have to put together a couple of workshops for the summer to talk about methods and talking about polarities. So I'm going to reach out to some of you for some help with that. But thank you so much. I'll be listening as I drive on mute. But thank you, everyone. I'd be happy to talk to you, Lisa, anytime. Thanks, Jill. Okay, my, thanks. My contact information. You can get me through uh, through this chat. Thank you. My, my email's on here. Okay. Okay, thanks. Great. Thanks. And I've hidden myself simply because I'm snacking. I don't want to be rude and eat in front of people. Oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Well, you brought up a lot of things, Rosa, um, that seem very obvious. And um, one of my frustrations in holding space for this group is that we don't have a sustained uh, membership which means it's been, been very difficult to build the trust so that we can go deep. And um, I even found that with the group that I started in, um, in two back in my community. So one thing that I'm beginning to get is that I'd, I'd really like to um, convene a group such as we have here, but gain people's um, you know, more commitment to it so that we can keep showing up and we can keep going into particular issues. Um, I, uh, in some ways, I'd actually like to take an issue, perhaps even tonight, if people are willing, and see if we could um, make some, some progress. I know uh, on one of our meetings where Scott <coughs> and Steve were on, we uh, took empathy. But I, you know, after that particular um, uh, session, I thought to myself, that was such a conceptual issue. And I'm wondering if we could maybe make some progress on an, a current issue that perhaps is difficult to talk about, and yet, um, you know, we could start to chip away at the edges of it. Nancy, and then I'll get to you, uh, Steve. Um, just quickly, first, two people, Rosa and um, Dennis, both heard the opposite of what I thought I was saying. I, what I thought I was saying is that the leadership hosting any event should be made up of leadership from the various groups or different groups you're trying to attract. And then together, they should be framing the issues, invitation, et cetera. So I just want to be clear that that is what I was saying. Secondly, if it's appropriate, 
I put out a number of ideas very emphatically, but I'm actually just testing them out. And I'd love to get feedback as to this notion of shifting into deeper problem solving and so forth as a way to go, does that make sense? I'd like responses to that if that doesn't distract us too much from what you'd want to say anyhow. And lastly, I'd love to hear from Mino. Thanks. I just Nancy, noticed in the chat window Mino? that Jason can talk now. Oh, good. Okay, thanks. Well, Steve had his hand up first. Let's hear from him, and then we'll go to, was it uh, Jason or, I'm sorry, maybe Lisa? Mino. Mino, I'm sorry. Let's hear from Steve and then Mino. Something Rosa said, I don't know exactly what it was, um, gave me an idea, and, and it is this. If a person fancies themselves a facilitator of dialogue between opposing sides, between Mars and Venus, I think it behooves that facilitator to understand both languages to take it upon themselves to learn both languages. Let me give you an example. One of the first, uh, again, I keep going back to these little formative moments in my life that, that I happen to remember, but very early in my career, uh, I attended a meeting that was run by the manager of the, of the group. And what he wanted to do in this meeting was solicit inputs. And I didn't know it at the time, but he used a classic sort of um, brainstorming technique where anytime someone uh, presented an idea, he would try to repeat the idea back to them in the way that they, again, I'm saying something I said before, but uh, repeat the idea back to them in the way that they agreed with, and then they would write it down on the board so we would have all these ideas listed. Now, in the types of conversations you're apparently trying to have between people from Mars and Venus, that's difficult if you only know one of the languages. You're going to have a very hard time teasing out from what the person said and repeating to them, in your words, what they meant. I think it's, I think the responsibility is on the facilitator of a, of a effort like that to learn both languages so that for example, if like if a conservative is there and starts saying words that just don't resonate with with the liberals who are there, the person needs to be able to hear through to the meaning underneath the words and be able to state it in a way that the liberals there will understand to sort of be the translator between the two sides so that you can sort of achieve more of this equilibrium and and reduce the amount of talking past each other. So may I respond um, to that, Linda? Yeah, please. I agree with you completely, Stephen. Um, I'm actually a bilingual translator from Spanish to English, and I really understand the value of speaking both languages. And I understand that you're also using the word language metaphorically here, not mm -hmm don't all speak English, but that there's different concepts and vocabularies um, that different political parties use. Um, I, in, in my organization, the development work, a, a really important part of it is doing individual interviews with everybody who's going to be at a meeting beforehand so that I can learn the language that is being used in that industry, in that particular sector, in those particular departments, in that particular organization, so that when everybody is in the same group, we can hit the ground running, as it were, and not waste that very valuable time of when people are together. Um, I, I was referring to when I said, what do you mean when you say X? I was referring more to the sense that uh, when there's people in a group who have very very different meanings for the same word, sometimes it's helpful for me to translate it, and sometimes it's helpful for me to invite the person themselves to say more about what it is that they mean. So just to clarify that point, but I completely agree with what you said. So I see Jason has his hand up, and I'm sorry, I'll get back. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. 
you can. Okay. Yes. Good. Uh, I'm just trying to figure this this thing out. Sometimes my mic does not work too well. Um, so a um, little bit about me. I think you asked it a little bit earlier. Uh, I'm in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I own a um, mediation and facilitation firm called Oval Options, and and we uh, help uh, companies and organizations and individuals with mediation and other conflict management processes. <clears throat> One of the things I do on the side uh, is public dialogue. Um, and uh, I usually go to um, a local brewery or a pub um, that I kind of know the, the owners of. And I'm a, I'm a beer geek too, so that helps uh, with my connections. And we invite the, anybody in the, in the public to come and talk about either a certain topic or uh, maybe uh, <clears throat> a free-for-all of, of any topic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that um, when we talk about language, um, it seems that the uh, language that we need to, or at least I have, used in the past is uh, the language of, of logic and reasoning. And what I do is I, I invite people to come and, and, and help them hone their uh, reasoning skills, no matter what they're talking about. And in doing so, the extremes of the right and the left come a little bit closer together because uh, when they find out that maybe their arguments aren't making much sense, uh, they may not admit right there that they're not making sense, but they, they kind of shed that little shell of extreme um, absolutism on their side. Uh, and that, that's worked um, for, uh, for most of the dialogues we've had. Um, it doesn't happen in one session. Uh, it doesn't happen in 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, but the next time they come to a dialogue, um, they they, they kind of adopt that language of reasoning and, and just how to formulate an argument. Uh, what, what's their evidence? What's their thinking process behind it? And to really kind of flesh out how they've come to their conclusions without, without really even talking about the conclusions themselves. Uh, if it's gun rights, uh, if it's healthcare, or if it's taxation, or uh, education, or whatever. That's, whatever their conclusion is, we don't really talk about it. We talk about how they come to those conclusions. Um, and, and for the most part, uh, all of the, the uh, I'll say about 96% of the attendees uh, really liked doing it. Uh, they learned something. Um, they, uh, uh, they found some common ground with, with the other side, if you will. Uh, and they had um, a, good, a good time doing it because they were in a brewery and they had a beer with them. <laughs> uh, so that, uh, that's kind of what I've, I've done on the side. Um, I've, I've done some other dialogues uh, in other countries, especially India, and it's a little different there. Because, uh, um, well, for various reasons, I won't get into it. <laughs> uh, but in, in the States, or at least in Denver, uh, having a little a chat at a brew pub um, uh, when I facilitate it and I keep things civil and make, every sure, make sure everyone's talking, um, uh, people are at least open to it. And I think that's, that's the important part is to get them open and get them kind of on the same language of, of kind of reasoning and, and argument. Thanks, Jason, for sharing that. That's a, a wonderful yeah. dialogic technique as well as to explore the uh, underlying thinking. Uh, I'd like to say some other things about that, but I've noticed, Mina, uh, you've had your hand up for some time. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, and I want to add to what Jason is saying um, of logic and reasoning. So I'm just going to share a few um, uh, approaches we have used or I have used. So in the Middle East conflict situation, what we did is we created uh, two narratives. And these narratives were uh, put side by side, you know, the Jewish narrative and the Palestinian narrative. And then we wanted people to see how the same situation, the same facts, could be interpreted differently. So that was sort of the logical side. But we also then moved deeper into emotions and would ask people things like, what are you most afraid of? What are you most angry about? 
And of course, this wasn't done until there was psychological safety in the group, you know, the relationship building and, and all of that. But we really got people to feel deeply heard and deeply understood, <clears throat> not necessarily agreed with. And that's what created those powerful transformative moments where, um, you know, uh, people from each, the other sides could actually uh, go and express empathy for the fears or the angers or the resentments of the other. So I think that level of emotional um, disclosure uh, leads to deeper understanding, which then lead, allows people to go further. The second point I want to make is with the Interfaith Women's uh, Initiative that I'm running here, what we have done is exactly what I think Nancy was saying, is action projects. So for example, we are all going together, visiting detained uh, detainees in the jails in New Jersey. Uh, these are people that are being rounded up right now and uh, are held with really horrible conditions and have no one, no family, no nobody to speak to. So we are providing visitations uh, to a group called First Friends of New York, New Jersey. And we're doing that together. And what that opens us up to is the abundance that, you know, we have so much to be grateful for. We have so much in common. We have so much to give rather than take away from each other. So we are, uh, by doing these action projects um, for the uh, oppressed, we are finding that we are bonding in such deep ways that we actually um, are able then to come back to the difficult issues, whether it's terrorism or Islamophobia or whatever, and talk about them because we have I don't know, zoomed out a bit, I think, from our uh, minuscule views of ourselves and our place on the planet. And we just build larger perspectives. So those are the two sort of examples I wanted to share. So I'm kind of wondering if there might not be some um, example of some issue we might try to take on in this group, something that uh, we could perhaps just play with. Um, I don't know if anybody like has a, a type thing. Pardon? Like, like a policy type thing, something specific like immigration or man-made climate change or something, something. Like is that what you mean? Yeah. I mean, obviously climate change is so huge, so maybe something I mean, maybe something that's you know really up, like this this firing of Comey. We probably all have very different perspectives about what's happening right now. Um, that would even be something that I'm sure if I'm, I mean, I'm sure that there's a lot of diversity even here that we could talk about. Um, one one really good exercise. I'm going to run with your Comey thing. Okay. Um, one really good exercise that I do is uh, with myself. Uh, because this is a practice, right? It's not mm -hmm. something, uh, I'll never be good at this, you know? Um, but one thing that I do is I work with the news to try to figure out why the other guys see my position as completely stupid. Now, I think uh, I've read a bunch of, unfortunately, I, I got inundated with Comey news today. I think I read about it for about 40 minutes. Um, and, you know, I, I really got a side with, with the conservatives on this one in the sense that the Comey news is like a lot of liberal news right now where you have these situations where something's happened and there's a really good chance that it, there's something corrupt behind it or something dead wrong or something that we view as evil. And, and it, it, it gets it gets promoted into news from about 10% of a news story. You know, what I think of as 10% of a news story. And I'll give the example here with Comey. Yes, it looks bad. Um, but it, it, it isn't necessarily bad. And when you read the news, it reads as if all we have to do is dig down enough and we'll finally be able to see that Trump called, you know, 
page and, and told him, you know, what's Putin got next that he's doing for me? You know, this, this thing depends totally on him. You know, and, and I, I personally don't believe that, but whether I believe it or not, I find it really annoying to have in the New York Times today, I believe it was nine out of 10 of the top stories were wrinkles on Comey. And every one of them was more or less a form of liberal speculation about what was going on that was wrong. And I find that offensive. I find it annoying. I find it not middle ground, not open-minded in the way that we should be. Um, I'm very concerned about our country. Don't get me wrong. I feel like we should have, um, you know, a an independent investigation instead of seven different ones. I don't know if we know this or not, but yeah, there's like, there's like four different official investigations to this thing or something like yeah, that. It's insane. So, um, and, and I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm going through that detail to just try and get across to you that there's this process that I think we should, we should all sort of do, especially when we're as political as I am, you know, to, to consciously every time try and look at this thing from the other side mm -hmm. to understand, you know, where you could be wrong. You know, and, and this is why, because I do this so much, is why I'm, I'm talking about this sort of 10% news factor in the news stories right now, because it's essentially vast amounts of speculation um, thrown in with a whole lot of wording that is is got to be deeply offensive to anybody that's a big fan of Trump. And, and it, it, it really doesn't do any good. You know, I feel like I'm wasting my time reading the news a lot of times. Yeah. I would agree. In fact, I, I, I was reading in your, um, your piece, Steve, um, how, from your point of view, conservatives get beat up all the time because we primarily have a more liberal progressive media. Of course, you know, Fox is the antithesis of that, but there's, no, there's you know, there, there's probably many more media sources that are liberal than there are conservative. I actually last night, because of the whole Comey thing, got onto Fox because I wanted to see, well, what is the other side saying? And I, I would agree with you, Scott. It's, it was a completely different story. And it was like a wake up call to me as a, as a more liberal person to realize, oh my gosh, there's this entirely different definition of what just happened. Steve. I have a comment, uh, well, one thing from what Scott was saying um, he was saying it's not this and it's not that. One thing it's not is journalism. As we like to think journalism is, um, you know, which is trying to dig down to the facts. It, it, it's more, it's more of a ideological spin. But the, the reason I raised my hand is, is to bring up a point that's occurred to me several times through the conversation tonight is is that there's an awful lot to unpack here. There are a lot of things going on. Uh, the thing that comes to mind to me in this particular case is the book Coming Apart by Charles Murray. Um, I'm going to look up a link from one of my blog posts, but he did a... Um, he. The book basically is, is, it's about human nature. We like to be around people who are similar to ourselves. And, and the country itself is in the process of self-sorting into these ideological geographic areas where most people within one geographic area are of one particular ideology or another. And when that happens, the thinking within that bubble becomes sort of an intellectual incest. It, it becomes a, 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 a closed epistemic system that answers all of its own questions. And there's, there's, there's no body in there to challenge it and say, well, time out just a minute here there might be another way way to see that and and that's one of the things that we're losing and so getting back to this idea of coming apart in these ideological bubbles um so there was an article it was actually on pbs i'll i'll put the links in the in the um whiteboard once i find them but it he said if he starts off with a question 
of if you want your children to grow up clueless about mainstream America, what zip code do you want to live in? Uh, and he, he, he does surveys. He does these sort of like pop culture surveys about, um, that, are, that are based geographically about what the culture is like in this part of the country or that part of the country. And, and what he finds is that the most, the highest concentrations of people who are clueless about what he calls mainstream white America are the ones who live in what he calls the super zips, which are essentially, uh, he, 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 there's a map um, where it looks like a picture of the United States at night with lit up areas where these super zips are. And this is based on his research, Charles Murray's research in his book. Now, in this blog post that I did, I took that map and then immediately underneath it, I put a map of the recent election results. They're essentially the same map. The places that are lit up as being clueless about mainstream America are the same ones that voted Hillary. Um, now, the point there is that these are also the same ones from which the industries of entertainment and media and education are owned and operated. And so that, to me, is an explanation for the observation that, that you made about, about what I wrote, about how um, the culture is essentially very left-leaning and most of the jokes, most of the, most of the, the commentary, just like what Scott said. It's all basically uh, Republican bashing or, or conservative bashing. So if you want to bring more people into discussions like this, um, you might entice them with somehow giving them the feeling that they will be heard. Because as a conservative, I can tell you, based on watching television on any night, on any channel, or reading almost any newspaper, I know that I am not heard. The, 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 the understanding of who and what I really am at my core just doesn't exist out there in the world. And uh, so if you want me to come to more of these meetings, not me in particular and this meeting in particular, but mm -hmm. if you want to facilitate groups to get more uh, conservatives in attendance, uh, you might do like that roughneck at the uh, on the oil rig did, and do more listening than talking, and 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 try to get try to do it in a way that the conservatives feel actually truly heard at a deep level, and then I bet they will come back and invite friends. Let me just real quickly uh, say a couple of things. I um, I just put down in the I don't know what you call it, but I put down a, a list of things to uh, the, the the various challenges that are involved with attracting conservatives to dialogue and keeping them there. Mm -hmm. I put that here in in, in the website. I, I don't know what it's the what white call that. And then and then after that, there's just a few points of that. And then after that, are about a half dozen points that are techniques around that cha those challenges. Um, and and those will those will probably give you a few things to think about. Um, I should have finished my thought on Comey also. I mean, just in the spirit of what you were saying, Linda, just picking a specific piece. Um, my, my viewpoint is that, my personal viewpoint is that, um, that we should just relax kind of as liberals in the spirit of what, um, you know, to, to draw some influence from, from what Steve just said, that we're not ever paying attention to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this investigation is going to take a long time, uh, potentially years. Um, I, I objectively, I don't really know whether Trump was involved in trying to lasso Russia and get it involved, but I'm willing to wait until this long ass thing is done. And I don't think we're going to find out a whole lot in advance of that. 
And I don't think it's appropriate to spend a whole lot of time or energy on it. I find it offensive. I think there's a lot of other things to worry about. A lot of liberals can disagree with me, and that's fine. But the, one of the reasons why I, I um, you know, try to give the other side the benefit of the doubt in situations like that is because I'm bad at giving them the benefit of the doubt, and it's relatively easy to do at this time. Mm -hmm. um, you know. So. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Dennis, I'm seeing you have your hand up. I got to run. Bye, everybody. It's been re really good. Sorry, I can't stay longer. But thank you. It's been a pleasure to meet you all. Great. Thank you, Dennis. Okay. Yes. Well, I think I think there's a couple of things that are uh, that I'm picking up from this conversation is we we really don't have containers where we can talk about current events like this that are safe where people can feel heard, and because we don't, then we keep being influenced by very ideologically oriented media. And that gets us all angry, keeps our fear level up, keeps our uh, trust down. And um, it's then when we do confront the other out there, it's almost like we don't know how to, what to say or how to do it. So I think it's, a, it's like a structural problem mm -hmm. and it's getting worse. I agree, Steve, people are self-selecting into these little bubbles. And so I, if I could wave my magic wand, I would have groups like this going on all the time where people could just drop in and talk about things like this where they feel heard. Rosa, did you have something? Yeah, I guess I just, I heard something in addition to that in what Stephen said. I mean, there's all the thing about people self, self-selecting and I heard the importance of people feeling heard and, um, so I guess for me, that always comes back to the structure, like what is our structure for helping people feel heard? So in the process that I work with, anytime anyone speaks, the facilitator's job is to reflect back so that that person feels heard. And, and sometimes it's very illuminating because when the facilitator is trying to reflect back, the person then feels a little emboldened and will actually say more than they might have otherwise. Like before they might've just said the tip of the iceberg, but when they actually feel met, then they'll say more of what's underneath their thinking. So I, I just, I don't think that we can assume that just because everybody has a chance to speak, that that means that everybody's going to feel heard. I think you're right. Absolutely. Um, I'm, Looking at Dennis, you that goes to. Uh, I'm sorry, that goes to what I said about learning both languages. Uh, you have to understand the language that the other side is is using in order f for them to feel heard. I think so, I, and I think that we're all learning that. I don't think a facilitator can ever know it all. But I do think by asking for clarity when something isn't understood, we slowly develop that insight, for sure. Well, I think uh, my suggestion is just go study the hell out of the righteous mind. <laughs> right. <laughs> because that really is a Rosetta Stone. I mean, if you see where that's coming from, uh, you know, then a lot of the things that didn't make sense to you before just ring like a bell and you can just see right through where it's coming from and with that background you might be able to tease out from somebody on the other side what what they really mean so here's another thing um, um someone here earlier said that give the person m more chance to to explain themselves more P part of the problem I, I i see is that um a lot of people don't even know themselves that well and why they feel that way. I think, um, you know, when I say study the hell out of the righteous mind, I mean both sides need to do that because people have these, these, these moral intuitions, right? These gut feelings about things and, and they try to articulate them, but they really don't have a deep understanding of even where those things are coming from. They just, it's like moral, it's like moral dumbfounding is what it's called. I know it's wrong, but I just don't know why. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so I think 
a lot of people themselves don't even know why they think something is right or wrong and have a hard time even articulating it. And I think um, if a facilitator were, were well studied in, in, in height, then they might be able to see through what the person was really trying to say and, and, and maybe try to say for them. So, so the person says, yes, that's what I meant. That's what I was trying to say. I, I think both sides are, are, are deficient in even knowing themselves to the point that they can crisply articulate what it is they, they really feel. Yes, I think you're getting at that. Can I jump in with a couple of points? Who's this? Is this? Uh, this is Jerry. It, Jerry, sure. Go ahead, Jerry. I, see um, hands up. I wanted to add something to the thread on how to uh, invite more conservative folks into the discussion. And, and I think there's a common assumption, even echoed in some of our comments, that we need to get the other side in the room. And my experience is that most of the social issues we face now, it's not a choice between side A and side B. Uh, it's, it's not social order or personal freedom. It's always how do we do both? It's how do we embrace the tension between those two? So I don't want conservatives in the room because I just want the other side represented. I want the other half in the room. My liberal perspective is probably just half of the real challenge. And I really need to have a dialogue with someone who says, you know, gee, that, that, that um, you know, personal freedom thing is really nice, but we need social order. We need structure and, and laws and regulations because we need to do both. Um, I want compassionate, uh, you know, social safety networks, but we also have to have a fiscally viable uh, structure. So we need to do both. Uh, and I think that's a different invitation than just asking someone to explain themselves or share their feelings. It's an invitation that says, you know, tell me about the other part, the other half of the concern that I have, because I may not see it. So the second point I wanted to mention was that uh, several times people have, have referenced the value of having people share the feeling behind the position. In the couple of groups we've had, we've also gone one notch further, which is to ask, tell us about the personal event behind the feeling. Something happened to you or someone you know or someone you love that makes that particular issue so pungent. And usually we want to do that in a small group, two, maybe three people. Um, but it, it, it creates a, more of a sense of shared data. Uh, and more sort of understanding of where the emotion is and why the position is voiced with such strength. So, mm -hmm. yes, I, a couple I, of comments. Yeah, I hear that. I think we're getting at some of the same things in terms of what is the thinking behind a position as well as what are the stories that perhaps helped the thinking come to be. And that, that gets back, Stephen, to what he stresses, which is we usually have a strong feeling before we have put it into rational words. So if we just stick with the words only, we can't get as deep as we can if we start with the emotion and what might have caused the emotion. So I think we're saying some of the same things. Uh, Jason, I'm seeing your hand up. Oh yeah. Um, so I'm gonna draw on my uh, two classes and undergraduate work um, in psychology. Uh, that was 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, and um, I, I've tried to combine that with my um, uh, masters in conflict resolution and all the stuff I've done and kind of what I've found out is that people uh, for the most part would, would rather win an argument than actually be correct um, or it'd be objectively right uh, and, and I think that's uh, when, when it comes down to um, uh, politics uh, or even any type of social interest I think it comes down to a belief system uh, much like a religion, and once you question a religion, uh, you're questioning someone's personal identity and their self-worth, and uh, if you don't listen to them or if they feel like they're not being heard, that just emboldens that belief, and then they want to win the argument, um, and to hell with being right. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's one of those things where uh, I, uh, I, I, I see, um, especially on the social media stuff, where Arguments are just, uh, they're going from, uh, they may mention uh, um, a topic or a, a maybe substance, and then it's just, 
it just dwindles quickly into you're wrong and I'm right. It's a zero sum game. If you're wrong, I must be right. Um, and then that just kind of emboldens their belief and, and makes them uh, feel that um, they've done something worthwhile uh, and uh, just continues their, their belief system. Uh, so I don't know if that's right. <laughs> No, uh, you're getting I, on a lot of on a lot of basic reasons why it, people find it very hard to communicate. Yeah, it, and it's and it's very difficult to to change people's minds, even if even if you wanted to. Um, what I I'm and I'm not religious at all, and that's I think that's probably where my uh, influence to believing everything is a belief <laughs> comes from. Um, but I, I I keep going back to the the reasoning and argument. Um, language is that um, you, you can have a position all you want or a stance on a substance or a, a topic all you want. Um, if you want to convince me of it or if you want me to listen to you, it better be a good argument. I mean, at least have some reasonings behind it. Um, if not, then as a, you know, as a facilitator, I'll let them go and, and, and try to dig it out. But as a person, what other side you're, whether you're, uh, Michael Moore or Donald Trump, if you don't have any reasons behind it, I'm not going to listen to you. <laughs> uh, and that's why in the dialogues that I do, I kind of tell people that I'm like, okay, give me your best argument because um, if, if you want people to listen to you and, and to actually take you seriously, you, I mean, it has to be a, a it has to at least structurally sound argument to have it. Um, um, have people at least listen to you because if you don't have that then it's just banter and it's and it's just throwing beliefs against the wall and see which one sticks right. right i mean i used to teach four and a half day retreats to teach people how to dialogue and mm -hmm. it really does take about that much time before people understand how to actually have a dialogue where people can get somewhere so that's part of the problem is that none of us really are sharing a common set of guidelines and um, in a call like this, we're not trying to develop. Well, yeah, and I think that that kind of plugs into maybe this the, the world of the internet, and you know maybe not because politics in the 1820s was horrible too. Um, but it, it in that it's do people actually have a self identity? What do they self identify with? Is it is it their family anymore? Is it their jobs? Is it politics? Do they get a lot more energy and excitement out of arguing? Um, what it is some people live for it and some people thrive on that winning the argument rather than understanding the, the issues. Right. Uh, and I, I try to watch the presidential debates and I lose about two clumps, uh, two big old things of hair off my head because I'm pulling. Them. <laughs> I was like, you guys aren't even talking about the issues. You're just, you're just trying to win the debate. And right. it's, um, it's yeah. very evident nowadays, I think. So. Our political process is very debate oriented. It does not model listening. You're absolutely right, Jason. Oh, <laughs> Steve, I noticed you had your hand up. Yeah, so another thing that I want to mention about, there's an awful lot to unpack here. Um, I think one of the things that I would like to remind us of is that what we're talking about right now, whether it's Comey or whether it's climate change or gun control or anything, it's a snapshot in time. It's like taking a picture. It's like taking a still picture of a four hour long concert or something and, and trying to convey the whole concert in this, in this one still photograph. Uh, I think a lot of what we're seeing is the culmination of decades of a trend that's led us up to this point. I want to read a paragraph of a transcript from Jonathan Haidt uh, recently on the Charlie Rose show. He said Mark Leela had a piece in the New York Times right after the election on the problem of identity politics and how this may have alienated a lot of people and contributed to Trump's victory. And in the response from many academics was ferocious. One of his colleagues at Columbia within a few days had some essay basically linking him to the Ku Klux Klan. But here is the point. This is Haidt saying, so Leela comes back with this brilliant point. He says, that's a slur. That's not an argument. 
And once he realized that, I realized, oh my God, that is exactly what's been happening to me. I've been saying some pretty provocative things, beginning with an Atlantic article with Greg Lukianoff, and I keep looking on the internet for people who will respond to it. And pretty much nobody is. Nobody is arguing against me for anything I say. But I do get a lot of people basically saying, I am a white male or I somehow am winking at racism, something like that. So young people who go through these colleges, they're exposed to rhetorical training that prevents them from learning how to engage. They are trained carefully in how to basically discredit your opponent. Slur, they learn to slur. They do not learn to argue. Mm. And, and so my point is that if we're gonna have, first of all, in real time, facilitate a discussion we probably need to put some ground rules right up the front that says one we're going to take turns two we're we're not going to interrupt each other and and maybe trace or maybe just lay out some basic rules of of how to make an argument and what qualifies as evidence the deeper answer is to start that training very early in the school curriculum um, this, to me, is where I think the problem really starts. Um, Height had an article that said the Yale problem starts in high school. I disagree. I think it starts in kindergarten. I think the entire K-12 and K-16 and, and, uh, and beyond, K-12 and beyond, uh, is very much leans toward this type of argumentation that Height is talking about and has kind of lost the basic art of how to construct an argument, how to have an argument, what counts as evidence, and, and, and how to put together, and how to do reason, mm -hmm. like has been mentioned here earlier. I, I think so, what we're talking about now is the culmination of decades of this happening, and so now we have people thinking that a slur is actually an argument. They don't even really realize what an argument really is. And so this is some of the unpacking we're faced with. I mean, it's nice to be able to try to facilitate conversations between people who might, who might disagree, but man, you, you're fighting a real uphill battle with all of these sorts of, of decades of, of uh, training, elephant training to use Heights words uh, against it that, that you have to try to pick apart in order to have one of these uh, meaningful conversations. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, what you say is, is right I'd on. love to see a future session with us around the issue of what are the ground rules that are needed for a productive gathering. You alluded to some of them around sort of legitimate debate, but my guess is there's a lot more understandings we need just to get together. Right. Be interesting so, to see what each of us thinks are as, as essential ground rules. Right. Normally, every group I ever facilitate, if I'm doing a face-to-face -face, uh, group in some setting, that is the first thing that we would do. And of course, this got started as really just a space where we're sharing experiences. Um, so there hasn't been any yeah, I, to do that. Um, let me second that that desire. I think it's a good idea. I don't think it's a, it's an it's an endless list. I think I think Rosa probably has. Um, off the top of her head, a fairly decent list that, that she used successfully, um, you know, and, and we're talking around those things as well. Right. So, right. I mean, I wrote um, can I up, just, so. <laughs> I know it's kind of late. I know it's kind of late. I was hoping that Steve might be able to give us a, a three or four minute um, summary on, you know, he, he has a certain, you know, I, I look at things from a personality standpoint using the big five theory. Mm -hmm. Steve has a, a, a a more sort of philosophical uh, way of looking at the difference. I was hoping we could maybe get get to that for just a few minutes. It doesn't take very long. On Are you what? okay with that, Steve? On yeah, I'm topic? okay with that. Is there? Well, um, I'm noticing. I don't want to. Rosa has a hand up, and I'm also noticing yeah. we have ten minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and Scott and I was unclear. You'd like Steve to do what exactly? To to talk about. Well, Steve, Steve talks about the different, the fundamental difference between people in his writings between liberals and conservatives in a certain way um, that, that I think is, is helpful. It's especially helpful to understand, you know, that a conservative would look at it that way. Um, 
it, right. it well, ties back to, to writings that he's been he's been involved in for many years. Right. I think what we need to do is plan a session where we really take advantage of that um, and perhaps okay. yourself as well. I, I actually thought this was going to be a very small call uh, with a few people on it. And I had the hope that we could come up with maybe a strategy for doing that. So maybe offline, uh, some of us can get together and maybe plan some future calls where we can take advantage of some of that material. Rosa, you had your hand up. Um, just briefly, I wanted to say, Stephen, I'm also a fan of this book. Um, I, I love it. I think he's a fabulous writer. And one of the things I particularly appreciate is how he tells the story of the evolution in his thinking. So he's not trying to say, this is the truth purely rationally. He's actually bringing you along his story of his discovery of coming to discover things that he um, initially. Yeah, that book is partly an autobiography yeah, of, yeah, of his intellectual life up until he wrote it. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. I love it. I also really, uh, I resonated a lot with your saying that what we're living right now is the culmination of decades of things that have been happening. Um, I really see the oldest law of politics as being divide and conquer. It's and so I actually think that a lot of this has been um, intentional. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't Aren't, aren't differences, but I think that there are people who, who benefit from pouring gasoline on, on the flames, but that's just my own take on it. Um, I do want to say something briefly about context because uh, somebody, I think it was Jason, was talking about how people don't listen online and I don't even try to facilitate things that are not face-to-face. -face. I do think it's possible, <laughs> but people I know who do it, you have to really monitor who's going to be in the group and how many posts per day because, you know, some people can just like, you know, we'll spend 10 hours posting and then they have 10 posts and, and to, to, it's like very hard to keep the participation in any kind of a balanced way in an online context, unless it's something like this where people are actually seeing each other face to face. And then I don't know who said this, but I just really want to acknowledge, I, I loved it. Um, I made a note here, something about, uh, embracing the tension between the two and having the invitation not be like we want some of those people to come over here but like we want the other half in the room um and i just thought that was beautiful and also um reminded me of a comment that had been said earlier about how it's not just two perspectives it's actually multiple ones even though there is also some degree of, of you know two camps but it if we look at it closely, there's, there's, there's more perspectives than that. And then I believe, Steve, you had written something in your guidelines about the importance of working on local issues. And I just really think that that is, is so key because if we're trying to debate, you know, presidential candidates, I just feel like people project all of their hoped for wishes on each side. And whereas if we're working on a, you know, what do we want the food system in our local cook? community to look like or something like that. I, I find that it's often much more possible to find common ground. I bet if you did that, you'd find a lot of conservatives looking a lot more liberal. Yeah, yeah. Because they'd be a lot more open to um, those more egalitarian sorts of things when it's focused on their own family or neighbors up and down the street. Sure. Just a little bit of feedback. Oh, I'm sorry. Great. Um, just it was just saying thank you because it's been a, a really great conversation. So, thanks, Rosa. I just wanted to give you a little feedback, Stephen, from your writing, and then we're going to have to close. My goodness, um, let's have one round where we can all kind of close out. But I, I thought a lot of what you were saying um, was really right on for some of the radical extremes of both sides. And I, I maybe I'd, well, I'd probably love to talk to you more about that. But it seemed like um, both sides are. Um, causing the radical ends of both sides are what's really causing a lot of our discomfort in bringing issues up that really a lot of um, mm -hmm. if we could just have the conversation we'd probably find ourselves coming closer and closer into the middle um, yeah absolutely yeah okay let's have a final yeah, round I'm right. sorry this I, I feel like this has been a kind of a scattered conversation and yet every, everyone is unique and we all start the process of getting to know who's doing what out there so um, who would like to just uh, end with any takeaway thoughts you have? 
Uh, well, um, I, I just wanted to, um, uh, uh, I think it was, Rosa mentioned uh, online facilitation. Uh, and I used to do that uh, volunteer for a, a place called Solia. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Um, S O L I Y A. Uh, and they, what they do is they, they bring together uh, students from the West and the Mid East is kind of their thing. Uh, so Israelis uh, and uh, maybe some Saudis and uh, Yemeni and Egyptian. And they get them together on, on a facilitation kind of like this where you have um, cameras and whatnot. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting. I haven't done it in a while because I've been so busy. But if you guys are interested in, um, looking that up, they, uh, they take volunteers and it's really interesting to get, talk about both sides of an intense situation <laughs> uh, in, in the Middle East. Um, but anyway, um, that's what kind of sparked my, my, uh, uh, my thought on that. Um, but yeah, um, so I, this is my first um, participation in one of these. Uh, I don't know how often you do it. I don't quite know how it works, <laughs> uh, but I like it. Uh, uh, and I put my email down on my, um, page, I guess you call it. Uh, so yeah, I, I look forward to more of these. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, who else would like to have their takeaways? I'll go next. Um, this also was my first participation. Thank you very much for being allowed to sit in. Um, I, I wanted to just um, I wanted to encourage us to come back to the righteous mind. I agree that that's a very useful framework. And I think it's particularly useful in understanding uh, some dilemmas, those cases where we're committed to two incompatible goals. Uh, and I think the righteous mind actually allows us to talk about dilemmas in a more intelligent way. Uh, it's not as if you get to pick one. Uh, the fact is they all have a complement. They all have one which pushes in the other direction and the real challenge is how do we somehow bring them together so i think that would even be a fruitful way to think about what kinds of guidelines or ground rules would we have to have for a group to uh for a group that comes from different kind of moral foundations for them to have a productive discussion right yeah i'm i'm really beginning to, i think you're right on jerry i'm really beginning to want to um attract a more stable group of us who want to go deeper with real ground rules. So maybe, maybe I'll put that out next time and maybe we'll see if we can find a group that wants to do that. Okay. Howard, how would you like to do a checkout? Uh, okay, I don't know if I can say anything coherent shortly or something. Uh, early on, uh, Ken mentioned something about, or uh, there was some conversation about uh, getting to know each, each other uh, before you go into anything and Ken use the words human to human and that's the the wording I use and I feel like I'm in agreement with this like setting up some guidelines more or less some suggested guidelines because that's my uh, experience with Bohm dialogue is where they ask invite everyone to hold loosely the beliefs and opinions because and what that relates to is this, uh, okay, so Jerry mentioned bringing in both halves. Uh, see, to me, beneath the ideological differences is the actuality of our lives, of like what works and what doesn't. And to me, if we unpack, if, if we come together, and it's similar to like looking at like how you arrived at those views, what I do now that I didn't used to do is like I'm not I'm more interested in what do you see rather than what do you believe are, are you interested in looking together at what's actually working in your lives and what's not working in your lives and and I feel like I can actually start with a with a brand new person and say I want to talk to you human to human because I care about you and I'd like to I would I wonder if you would like to look at this together with me I know we both have our uh, views but would you actually like to look together and see how that works and you you describe to me what you see and we look together which brings in that issue of listening again I feel like I my experience suggests that 
this would be one of the guidelines too. Do we really, that we really listen to each other to hear where each person is coming from, what they're trying, what they're actually seeing. Can we see what they're seeing and feeling if we listen and get past maybe the different usage of language, but just really try to hear them. And again, that would be initial guideline. And I feel like, I feel like most people, regardless of where, where their ideological views are, will respond to, I would like to look together with you as another caring human being. And so anyways, but it, that's just briefly what I would suggest. Thanks, Hal. Appreciate it. Just real quick, because I, I got to sign off uh, in a second, but uh, thank you, everybody. There, everyone had such good, good splinters of thoughts, and, and um, I think it's especially exciting for me to see people, um, you know, really clinging to Righteous Mind, which is a wonderful uh, sort of guidepost. I, I think especially for liberals, it's really, really good that way. Um, you know, conservatives take to it like water. They just, it's like ducks to water, and and I think we don't. And the process of just kind of wrestling around with some of the issues in there um, is really helpful. So anyway, thank you for your thoughts, everyone. Bye-bye now. Thanks for being on the call for us. We're with us. Steve, would you like to add any uh, final thoughts? Uh, well, I was waving to Scott just then, not raising my hand. But um, no, nothing comes to mind right now that I feel like I need to add on as a tagline at the end. I, I always enjoy these conversations and I, uh, I would love to participate in more of them. Okay, great. Wonderful. Mino, would you like to have any final thoughts or say any last? Yeah, yeah. thank you. I love the idea of uh, talking about guidelines and rules because I've written some dialogue guides for the different forums I work with and I'd love to bring that. Great. And um, also, I really appreciate, um, you know, the reasoning side, but I always look for how to create heartfelt connections. Right. And um, hopefully the guidelines can help, uh, you know, address that. Right. Yes. <gasps> Thanks, you know. Rosa, would you like to say anything as a checkout? Just thank you to everyone here. It's been a rich conversation, and I, uh, I have appreciated uh, the, the, the various contributions very much. Thanks so much. So has everyone other than myself checked out? I think they have. So I'd just like to thank everyone. Um, I'm really just absolutely humbled by this process. Every single call has been so different, and of course we need guidelines. We need much, much, much more unpacking of this material. It's, it's, um, I think where I'm at is I'd like maybe to form another convening team, Rosa, just like what we did with our DD can and see if we wanted to take this further, um, how to actually get a committed group going with real guidelines and a structure that would allow us to go deep. So um, I may be putting out to the various people who have been on these calls a request for some kind of convening team, maybe as a next step to do that. Um, so um, I appreciate everyone's input. It's been rich as it always is. And um, if you'd like to jump on a convening team with me, please, you know, please respond back. And with that, um, hopefully we will see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Bye.